Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and this is the podcast where we talk about things that matter. Uh, we have a returning guest today, Dr. Tom Askell. We're going to be talking about the SBC, uh, the annual meeting that's coming up in June, just right around the corner. Uh, are we better? Are we worse than we were a year ago? Um, maybe some other topics regarding the SBC, some issues regarding the sex abuse task force and things like that. So hope you enjoy the show. Tom, Dr. Hi. Askell, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Well, well, I'm liking the beard. Well, I like the beard. Thanks, that's what happens whenever you live without water and electricity for a few weeks. And, uh, so this was from Hurricane Ian. Oh, wow, yeah, okay. Let it stay. Yeah. Wow. I thought it was, I thought Vody was, was, uh, <laughs> encouraging you or maybe you lost a lost a bet or something yeah well you know i always want to be like Vody. so yeah it's true i mean that's got the thing going too it's good yeah he's he's rocking his i like it um well thanks again for taking some time i know you've been on before um we're coming up on new orleans new orleans uh is where the annual meeting will be for the southern baptist convention you are still in it you ran last year uh as president and and we know how that went unfortunately um what what can we what can we expect uh just kind of coming into the meeting or let's bat before we get there are we better in 2023 now going into the meeting in new orleans than we were a year ago going into the meeting in anaheim oh well i think in some ways you know we are uh, much worse actually i mean we've got lawsuits that are uh, making their way through the court system the a uh, lawsuit against Kevin Ezell and Nam that has been going on for years. I mm. had uh, a court date in June. I understand that's now been bumped beyond uh, June. So you you got that. You got the lawsuit the SEALs have uh, filed as well, and Johnny Hunt has filed. Um, <clears throat> so those things, you know, the, just the, the clouds that hang over there. You've got the Department of Justice that has an investigation that's been opened on the SBC. You've got this um, uh, abuse reform implementation task force that uh, came out and said they're going to go with guideposts and mm -hmm. only under severe pressure decided, well, in the spirit of cooperation, we are not going to do that. You've had how many, we don't know how many more. It's, I'm guessing it's got to be hundreds and hundreds of churches that have left the convention since Anaheim, I mean, if my email and contact is any indication, then we've got large numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, churches that have left because they're just frustrated and disappointed with the way that the platform has dealt with just regular pastors and, and messengers uh, uh, at Anaheim and, and beyond that. There just seems to be a regime that is in place that has uh, leadership that has an agenda that they're going to push no matter what. So I think all of that is bad, but maybe the good news is, is all of that's become a little more apparent this year than it has in previous years. And so people are, uh, as, as one pastor has told me who was really in the thick of the uh, leadership and pressing the agenda that we've seen the last many years, he was the, in the thick of it. He said, I've been red pilled mm. and I, uh, this really isn't about sex abuse. It's about power. And, uh, and he's saying that in the presence of some of his closest friends who are still very much driving that agenda. So that's happening. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, it's kind of like with COVID and other things, you have a lot of people who maybe weren't really believers to begin with or, you know, wishy-washy and they, well, I don't need to go to church. And so you really have kind of this core. Some churches seem to be, you know, fake churches or just really wishy-washy churches and others stood firm and that attracted kind of like a magnet. A lot of people who want to still fellowship with the saints mm -hmm. and, you know, oh no, lockdowns and crazy. And we're seeing a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the assumptions we had um, in 2020 and 2021 about masks, social distancing, vaccines, whatever, yeah, oh, lo and behold, those are actually all more or less true. That's come to find out. But in the meantime of that, I think there's been the positives of, you know, strengthening local churches in general mm -hmm. and also kind of exposing more of a, a night and day type of um, distinction that we didn't always see. And we'd get people. It was harder to see before before COVID and lockdowns yeah. and stuff. So, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good to good to see the positive. Um, the sex abuse task force guidepost. So, are we now not? I'm not, I haven't really kept up with that too much. Guidepost is no longer being used by by the task force of the SBC. Is that correct? They're reconsidering it. You know, they came out and they, they had all these these uh, criteria. And basically the criteria, at least the way it struck me, were written in such a way that only guideposts could uh, meet them all. It's, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and, it, it, and I don't want to be cynical, but it's hard not to be whenever you have people who are in positions of, of knowledge telling you things. Um, there are folks on that task force who were insistent, as I've been told, that it was going to be guidepost or bust, that, that mm. there wasn't going to be another, another alternative. And so they came out and they said, well, guidepost solutions is the only company that can do this. Look at all these things. We, we needed all these 12 or 15 things done. And only wow. one company of all the companies we looked at could do that. And of course, you know, guidepost is uh, very proud of their support of the LGBTQ plus uh, agenda. And they, they are been unashamed in declaring that they, they issued a, a statement on social media last year before the convention in Anaheim advocating, you know, talking about how proud they were for their advocacy and support. And that got them in a lot of hot water with a company that had just paid them millions of dollars to do this report that was presented to Anaheim because the Southern Baptist had paid that much. And they obviously had aspirations for doing more with Southern Baptist, getting more millions from Southern Baptist going forward. And there were people on that task force who advocated that as well. And we've got a consultant on the task force who's not even a Southern Baptist who has been pushing guideposts as well, as I have been told. So there was so much pressure put on the task force once they announced, we're going to go, we're going to recommend guideposts to handle uh, the implementation of these things. Um, I know for a fact that there were multiple pastors who met with the chairman of the task force, Marshall Blaylock at First uh, Baptist Church in Charleston, and others that contacted him. And some of those men talked to me privately and basically said, in, in the words of one of them, this is a bridge too far. If this happens, then we're gone. Yeah. And we're talking about churches that have been in the SBC a long time, some of the leading churches in terms of financial support. And I, I think what happened is probably that landed on this committee and they, they probably asked themselves, do we want to be the people that go down in history as responsible for taking the SBC under by forcing out some of our best, most high profile church churches because of our insistence of going with an LGBTQ plus affirming company to handle sex abuse in the SBC. And despite some protestations of some on that committee, they said, we better pull back and reconsider this. So that they haven't said they're not going to use them, but they have said uh, that they're reconsidering it. And, you know, sadly, I mean, Marshall Blaylock, uh, I, everything I know about him, he's a good guy and nice man. But uh, he, he, in his justification initially for choosing uh, guidepost, he said, well, they have not made another social media statement uh, since June of last year, you know, about this. Well, okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, yeah, no, they made know. the one. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. So, anyway, but I, so I just think maybe that's a good sign that Southern Baptists are waking up. Yeah. to the play that is being run on our churches. And I hope so, because if, if enough churches finally do wake up, that's what it's going to take for God to, uh, to wake us up and to cause us to stand up and say, we're not going down these roads any further because it is about power. It is about uh, a, a social agenda that uh, is using all kinds of real issues in order to promote what it is they think will make the world a better place. Mm. Not to get, although, you know, conspiracy theories these days, you know, it's like, this is the theory. It's crazy. Looney tunes. And six months later, it's like, Oh yeah, that was true. Uh, it sure seems like it anyway. Um, not to go too down that road, honestly, but I mean, is there, I mean, you mentioned one, one person on the task force within the SBC. So just for those who don't know, obviously the SBC is a convention of churches, thousands and thousands of churches, and each year we send people the annual meeting. 
Uh, and was it 2019, right, that they 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 saw this issue with sex abuse? Uh, there was the Houston Chronicle article, and mm -hmm. there was multiple churches, and all of a sudden things are flying off the handle and craziness. Oh, there's sex abuse in all these churches. We need to investigate that. And it inaugurated in 2021, correct, to, like, investigate it? Okay. And then 2022 is when we settled on guidepost. Or well, we, had, no, we had already settled on 2021, right? Right. Okay. To do the, yeah, to do the investigation. Who, basically, I mean, they added a couple of stories that we hadn't heard about. I think Johnny Hunt uh, was one, and maybe there was another one. But they basically took the Houston Chronicle stuff, repackaged it, and said, oh, you know, here's what we've discovered. Uh, although they did put, like, David Seals in a mugshot photo yeah. in their report. So, and the report's been debunked, and it's provoked lawsuits. Um the report's been debunked in some some areas. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, it's just it's a mess. It's a mess that hasn't served anybody well that I can tell. Mm -hmm. It really hasn't served those who have suffered sex abuse well that I can tell. But it has uh, cost Southern Baptist millions of dollars already. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we paid. So we paid this group, the secular group who's pro LGBT in after June 2021, and then we took the report in 2022, and of course, then they post the LGBT pride stuff in June there as well. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the uh, was it Blaylock say, oh well, they haven't posted anything since. Well, right. they're already affirming that, and they also already have our millions of dollars <laughs> to run this report, yeah. uh, which was an it was basically an investigation, right? They're talking to people, and yeah, that's right, that's right, that's what it's supposed to be, right? Okay. Um. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, I mean, I will say at least as a positive, uh, I'm thankful that, and maybe we can touch on this a little bit, the few churches, one of which of course was Saddleback that was kicked out for having female pastors. Um, can you flesh that out a bit as far as even, I don't know, again, you've been in the SBC a long time, uh, several decades and, you know, saw the tail end or really kind of in the middle of the last resurgence, conservative resurgence. I was there from the beginning, man. I'm old. Where are you? Okay. Okay. I don't, well, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> I say like Tom's an old guy or anything. No, um, 79 was my first convention. Wow. 79. Wow. That's praise God. That's great. Um, okay. So again, I know we've talked a little bit about that, you know, in previous conversations we've had, but was this, I mean, it was an issue. I mean, I remember hearing stories at Southern. I mean, Moeller went there in 93 and, you know, he was seeming more middle. And a lot of people don't know that. As far as I know, he's he wasn't on the left or the right. He was kind of a moderate. And from what I could tell, he was not for, although not really against, and maybe you can correct me, uh, female preachers. I mean, there were women studying to be pastors there at Southern Seminary, no doubt, Southeastern and other places. Um, that issue's come up again. Yeah. What, 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 why? And I, I guess, I mean, probably it's a obvious answer but what is your experience in you know the last 40 plus years and looking at kind of the trends and, and things like that just the female pastor thing i mean we even see now last year you know to Mueller's credit stood up at the convention in anaheim you mm -hmm. know if we have to write a report and investigative or little thing you know we'll lose our conviction or whatever it was pretty passionate i think your brother was actually standing there mm -hmm. uh nearby uh if i can remember but it, it was lead pastor and we now have this distinction like well there's a function of a pastor and the role of a pastor can you flesh that out for us tom and just kind yeah, of what's let, going on let me first say that uh, what most people don't know is that when al Mohler was a student at southern seminary he actually signed an open letter advocating for women pastors mm, uh, wow. so that's where he was as a student now he got over that by god's grace and uh when he went to southern he was very clear when he went there as a president. He said no. And they, they had some very tense moments in those early years where he said, look, uh, you know, you can study here, but we're not the Southern Baptist. We're not going to have women pastors. You just need to get, get that in your mind. Yeah. And uh, he was on the Baptist Faith and Message Revision Committee that came out with the BFNM 2000. He has said that it was not the intent of that committee to limit the role of pastor to uh, lit, to just lead pastor to qualified men to just, you know, to serve as lead pastors, but that that was any pastor. He has advocated rightly so in Baptist history that uh, we don't distinguish between the uh, office and the function. 
of that uh, office. And so, yeah, I all did a good job on the floor last year in, in Anaheim and speaking to this issue. And so what happened last year was the credentials committee said, you know, we're not sure that everybody agrees on what a pastor is. And so, you know, we, we don't want to make a decision about Saddleback who very, very loudly ordained, historically ordained for the first time in history uh, in Saddleback, you know, three women pastors and Rick Warren in the middle of that. And uh, I mean, it was like, okay, they're just going to do this to kind of throw down the gauntlet. And when they were reported, the credentials committee said, well, we're not really sure what a pastor is. <laughs> and so I was thinking, okay, you know, we're in deeper trouble than we thought. So there was so much protest from that, that they actually brought to the full executive committee, the recommendation that Saddleback along with other churches who have women pastors be removed. And mm -hmm. the committee voted to do that. Now, everybody looks at that as a massive win. The people on our side say, oh, well, that's good. Well, I, yeah, right. There shouldn't be women pastors. I think the Bible's clear on that. I think the Baptist faith and message is clear on that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who don't, but I just think they're wrong. They think I'm wrong, and that's okay. We, we have that understanding. <clears throat> but there are too many people on our side say, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. See there, the convention's not in bad trouble. You guys that have said we're going the wrong path. This is a good, good thing. I'm not convinced because it was not, I don't know if it's 24, 48 hours before um, you you had President Bart Barber come out and say, look, this is not a done deal. Saddleback can protest this. They can try to get this overthrown on the floor of the convention in New Orleans. You know, they, they can actually make an appeal. And Rick Warren came out saying, you know, I'm going to appeal this and I'll do it in the right time, right my way. And Dwight McKissick, when he heard, oh, you can appeal this. Well, maybe this is God's blessing. God's doing something new in the SBC. So I fully expect there to be an appeal. I expect Rick Warren to be given the microphone in New Orleans the way he was in Anaheim. And yep. you know, if you recall, but he got a standing ovation after he talked about all the things that he had done and you know, training a million ministers. And that's more than the SBC seminaries, all seminaries combined and other things that he's done. Uh, he got a standing ovation. Well, if he can win the room in New Orleans, he can get this overturned, not only for his church or Saddleback, but also other churches that have women pastors, of which there are now dozens and dozens, if not hundreds. I mean, I don't know. There's a petition going around where women pastors are signing it saying, you know, basically come get us. But some of them aren't Southern Baptists. So I don't I don't know what the full count is. I know that's been documented that we have dozens and dozens and dozens uh, women pastors in the SBC. I just heard about one uh, recently uh, from a former intern of mine who called me and said in his state convention, they just discovered it a few weeks prior. So here's what I expect to happen. Rick to make a statement, to be a big debate on the floor. And I would not be surprised if Rick and his uh, people with him win the day. And then that issue for those churches becomes a dead issue. And uh, the platform will be able to say, see there, the messengers have spoken. We promised the messengers would be able to address this, uh, this issue. They have spoken and um, have everything look like it was done above board. And the concerns of so many who have been voiced for many, many years get slapped to the curb again. Because if the platform, if the executive committee really wants to deal with this issue straight up or straight down, they will take the amendment that was proposed to the Constitution, Article 3, last year in Anaheim by Pastor Mike Law, and they will bring it to the whole convention to vote on. And in that simple amendment, Mike has offered that we uh, adjust our confession of our Constitution to say that only men can be pastors of any kind in Southern Baptist churches to be in friendly cooperation. Yeah. Now, he's got over 2,000 Southern Baptist pastors' signatures on that amendment saying, we want a voice, we want to vote on this. And thus far, the, the executive committee told him initially in February he could come and speak and they were going to vote on it. And then right before that, they said, well, no, we're not going to vote on it. We're too busy. You know, we'll vote on it right before the convention. Uh, I smell a rat. Mm. Um, again, call me a cynic, but I smell a rat. If they wanted to vote on it, they wanted the messengers to have a straight up or down voice on it. They would present Mike's amendment to the floor, let the floor decide, let the messengers decide and go forward. But I can see a play where they are able to come out on the other side saying, see there, the messengers voted. They all voted with Rick Warren after his uh, speech and 
they don't want to kick his church out of the convention. So who knows? We'll know, obviously, in New Orleans. Wow. Um, why? <laughs> so he mentions power, right? And that, that seems to be the case. And, you know, that's ironically what, you know, a lot of the critical race theorists and others, oh, it's all about power and race and this and this and this. Obviously, you're very much not <laughs> in that camp. Uh, and I'm not saying you are by any means. But in one sense, you know, it's like money is power. Knowledge is power. If you have, you know, money is the root of all kinds of evil, the scripture says. So, I mean, there are certain things whether whoever has it, whether it's power or money or influence, you know, it can be a good thing or a very bad thing, but it's kind of like, you know, money makes the world go round. Also another kind of trite phrase, but why exactly? I mean, that's one thing I don't understand really. And, and, you know, I'm probably more, <laughs> I'm a glasses half full, I think overall, but I also know people are deceitful. I know people lie. I know people, you know, even profess believers or, you know, even as Christians, you know, will we'll follow some other way or, or think this is for the greater good or, well, more people will get saved or it's for my family or whatever. Meanwhile, it's sin, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's the point? I mean, I don't understand the play here of, of these conservatives we're all conservatives as you know ed Litton said two years ago and, and and other things like that kind of scratching their head at things like the cbn or even you guys at founders and oh, everybody's just making a big deal about nothing mm -hmm. we're all conservative we all love jesus we're all baptists blah 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 then what, what what's happening like why who are they taking their orders from i guess is my question yeah well i mean i've had uh a, a very well connected a political guy, you know, I mean, a strategist, somebody who's been involved in American politics a long time, sit me down. And uh, I was a cynic about these things. And because I've, I've had it now from two different people who've been in positions to know drawn up for me. Mm -hmm. And it may, here's, here's the simplest thing that I can describe that makes perfect sense to me is after Hillary Clinton lost the election in 2016, it was supposed to be her coronation. You know, everybody, she didn't have to campa campaign because it was her turn. And this is what's going to happen. And you got the uh, email controversies and then, you know, uh, Donald Trump uh, unexpectedly to many people pulls it out. He's elected. And I don't know if you recall all the leftist journalists and everybody, somebody's done a montage of them all just crying and like the world has ended. You know, how could wow. this happen? Well, they did post mortem. You know what happened? Well, she didn't. She didn't go up to Wisconsin and campaign, and you know yada yada yada. And they said, no, no, no. Wait, look. Here's what happened. Eighty something percent of conservative evangelicals voted for her, mm. and so you as voted a, voted against her. Well, against her, yeah. Voted, okay. voted for her not to become president. Voted for. Okay. Her. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got to get that straight. And so, the, the, as it was explained to me, if I were uh, a, a political operative for the Democrats. I would immediately, immediately begin to figure out how do I shave that 80 something percent figure down five or six percentage points. Mm. If you do that, you hand the next election to the Democrats. Mm. OK, that makes perfect sense to me in terms of political operations. Well, if you're going to do that, what's the biggest player in the evangelical world in America? It's the Southern Baptist Convention. OK, how do you then begin to dismantle the Southern Baptist Convention or to shave that off? Well, if you can convince enough people that it's immoral to vote for Donald Trump, you can't be a Christian if you vote for Donald Trump. You need to repent if you vote for Donald Trump. I mean, how many times have we heard variations of that theme yeah. not just leading up to his election, but especially in his attempted reelection. How can you do this? You can't do this and, and be true to yourself. You know, you, a character doesn't matter. All these things that were designed to shame people who might vote in, in my case against the democratic party. Cause I, I will vote against anybody that stands on that platform till the day I die. Cause it's a godless demonic platform. Well, they were affected. They were effective mm -hmm. and so shaved that off. I do. I'm not so naive as to think that there are not evil forces at work who want to dismantle the SBC. And again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I am a conspiracy realist. And <laughs> Neville is a conspirac conspirator. We see it throughout written history, and the Bible certainly talks about this. So we shouldn't be surprised if attacks on God's work, God's people, on God himself, 
are effectively utilized to push back God's people, especially those who are naive and not thinking or not well taught, not being well shepherded, as we saw in the whole COVID nonsense that went on. And that causes God's people or those that are part of the, the structures the churches of God's people being moved left are being forced into some kind of silence so that evil can go forward. And yeah. man, that's exactly what is happening. I'll have that debate with anybody any day to just look at the evidence of what has happened over the last four years. And it's shameful. And God's people who know the Bible, believe the Bible ought to be ashamed because so many have gone silent. They've gone mute when the word of God is crystal clear. I don't mm. know if you saw Rosaria Butterfield and her very public apology and repentance. I did. Yeah, I saw a few clips of it. I didn't see. I didn't hey, see physically her saying it. But yeah. Praise God for that. We need yeah. more like that. How many people have, have tried to shame us into using pronoun hospitality as J.D. Greer and Ed Litton and others have called it, saying we need to be willing to call LGBTQ plus trans people, whatever they want to be called, because yeah. that's that's loving them. Well, Rosaria Butterfield said, yeah, I did that. I advocated for that. I was wrong. It was sinful. I've now seen that it's sinful. I repent. I did it publicly. I'm repenting publicly. Well, sadly, yeah. that's that type of public repentance for public sin is such a minority report among evangelicals that I don't know if we'll see anybody else do it. But it shouldn't be a minority report if we believe the gospel because the gospel yeah. is for repenters and believers. And again, it should not be uh, a, a, such a high bar to overcome to lead us to repent. But I'm not holding my breath waiting for other people to follow suit. Mm. Is it, I think I'd asked you about that in one of our other conversations, but I mean, is it just fear of man, I guess? I mean, there there are multiple seminary presidents that I would like to say right. a few more clear words and apologize for other things that they pushed or hired guys or whatever in the last, say, five or so years. But they don't do it or they kind of course correct, but they don't. You know what? I was yeah. wrong. That was stupid. I that was sinful. I, I repent. Please forgive yeah. me. Yeah, they erase their websites, you know, yeah. so they take the pages down, the references down. Uh, but it's almost like, you know, being a leader means you never have to say you're so sorry. And uh, the 11th commandment is you never criticize anybody in the SBC and leadership publicly. Yeah. And I, again, OK, but what does the gospel say? Yeah. What does the gospel say? And, yeah, I could wish that men who have done foolish things would own their foolishness publicly it would certainly not cost them what they fear that it will cost them. I think it would earn them credibility with people who really do believe the gospel and yeah. want best for them. So what is it? I, I don't know. I'm, I've had people tell me it's all financial, that they're just getting their pockets lined. I don't want to believe that. You know, I don't mm -hmm. have any evidence of that. But people who, you know, should be in positions to know or at least to have some insight have argued that to me very, very strongly. But I can tell you this. I don't know how you live with the fear of God and live like that. I don't know how you really believe that God is worthy to be feared and the day of judgment is coming and you let that kind of thing go. It seems to me that if you were zealous for God's honor and you didn't fear people and you feared him, that you would be willing to take the stands required that, that in the eyes of the world might hold you up to ridicule and scorn. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. There's not really, how can you fear God and also operate in this way? Yeah. Hire this person, platform this guy or gal. Yeah. Um, well, let's land this plane. I know you don't have a ton of time today. Um, what, what can we expect going forward? Uh, maybe just we can touch briefly on abolition versus pro-life for those who don't fully know. I mean, I really learned, at Nashville, you know, kind of that those aren't the same thing. Right. Um, and I've heard it articulated got by guys like, um, Oh, what's his face? Uh, um, Apologia studios, Jeff Durbin. Yeah. Jeff Durbin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and guys like that who are very, very involved. Um, and you know how this actually, this type of legislation sounds great, but it's actually not great. It actually makes it worse. So what, what can we expect with the pro-life, uh, abolition debate, 
uh, and other things going into uh, New Orleans in June? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm not wanting to measure everybody by, by my own experience, but I'll just tell you what happened to me is I've been pro-life since as long as I understood the issue, which has been a long time. But I thought all pro-lifers uh, believed like I did, wanted to end abortion immediately. And as soon as possible, wanted to recognize the unborn baby as a real human being made in the image of God, worthy of all the rights and privileges and protections of any a uh, full grown human being at any stage of life. But as legislation has been proposed and spiked, been shot down by so-called pro-life uh, congressional leaders and pro-life organizations, it became obvious that we're not talking about the same thing, even though we're using the same vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And so what I came to be convinced of is that so much of the pro-life movement really does not want equal protection under the law for unborn children, though they might talk about them as children and they might say we need to uh, protect the unborn uh, babies. Well, OK, then let's have legislation that protects them equally with those that are 50 years old. As well, mm -hmm. no, 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 if you do that, yeah. then uh, the people who have abortions are going to be culpable uh, in a legal sense. And to see some of the hair splitting and some of the inane argumentation that has been used to try to justify I'm pro-life, but I don't think we ought to hold the woman who says, I can't wait to have another abortion. I know it's a baby and I can't wait to kill it. We can't hold her legally accountable. Uh, we're not on the same team. I, we're just not. So the abolitionists so-called have carved out this ground and started shining the light on those so-called pro-life organizations, some of whom, like 70 plus of them, signed a letter, open letter last year to kill a bill in Louisiana that would have been right. the first one passed in the nation that yeah. would have granted the unborn children equal protection under the laws that we already have on the books. Um, I don't want any part of that pro-life movement. You call me whatever you want to, but I want to argue for the ending of abortion right now and granting unborn children the same protections of those who have been born have. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, I think that that's probably where I was at too, to a degree, not to just piggyback what you said, but <laughs> like, well, yeah, we're pro-life versus pro-abortion. Like, yeah, we shouldn't kill babies. Like, yeah, right. we should we stop doing we, that. We thought we all were on the same team, meaning the same thing. Yeah. And what I have discovered too, is there's a pro-life industry where mm -hmm. Worst thing that could happen to them as an industry is for all abortion to be made completely illegal everywhere mm -hmm. because that puts them out of a job. And I, I hate to say that, you know, I don't think that's true of, of all the Christian pro-life organizations, but again, I think you have to be pretty naive to think that isn't true about some of the pro-life organizations. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a few Rand Paul's our one of our senators here kind of polar opposite of Mitch McConnell, <laughs> the other one here in Kentucky, but I, I've heard a few, uh, stories when he first got elected and then his second term and so on that when it was president and Senate and it was all Republican uh, in the house, it was like, they could have done a number of things. And they're like, but if we do that, basically we'll kill the boogeyman and we won't have a platform to continue to rile up the base. And, uh, and it's like, <laughs> I mean, it, it drives me up a wall. I mean, in one sense and, and not, and I don't even think about it that much. I can't imagine people who are really super involved uh, mm -hmm. because it's, especially as a believer, like this is the truth and this is a lie and Jesus is better. G like, yeah. why are we not acting, especially within the SBC? Why aren't we acting like Christians? Why aren't we acting, you know, forget the world, you know, Nashville, 2021, you know, the world's watching that whole thing. And, you know, that was very quiet there in Anaheim. Um, but, it's like, okay. Uh, okay. Like, I don't, well, who cares? Like, wh why are we, why are we concerned about this? Um, but there just seems to be a lack of fear of God and a deep fear of man. Yeah. So I agree. Any, anything else we should be expecting? I'm going to be there. I'm taking a, hopefully four other messengers besides myself down to Anaheim or uh, New Orleans rather. Mm -hmm. um, what else can we expect on the floor there that you know about? Uh, any hints or anything of people challenging Bart Barber or things like that? Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've, there's a group that says anybody, but Bart, you know, that is <laughs> trying to gather up uh, support. And uh, I've heard that there, there may be uh, someone 
who will be nominated. Maybe it'll just be at the last minute, which, you know, did that, that did happen during the conservative resurgence. They would go into conventions not knowing mm. uh, who were going to be nominated. But, uh, you know, uh, again, I love Bart, but uh, we need somebody who understands the issues to be uh, the way they really are and not to think that things are basically great. You know, let's just keep going forward. We need yeah. somebody who, who thinks deeply enough about these things. Uh, I was very disappointed with Bart when he appointed an, an outspoken known liar to this task force because he was a friend of his. And uh, when he put, um, you know, Todd Binkert on there, um, that just was an indication that he's going to follow an agenda that's different than an agenda of what I think is necessary at this hour. So, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see if another uh, candidate is announced, but I hope there will be one and uh, hope that we can have an honest uh open discussion about the real issues. But again, the platform controls how all that is, uh, uh, how that's allowed. And I'm, we haven't seen, we don't have much reason based on recent history to anticipate that there will be a free opportunity to engage the issues uh, rigorously in New Orleans. But if enough people show up, if enough good messengers show up who have their eyes open, who've been red pilled, then we can stop this thing and begin the process that we need to start at some point soon to uh, reverse fields and to see us get off the downgrade that we've been on. Yeah, that's the key. Enough messengers. That's right. So anybody listening, watching, send your messengers, even support, pray, go. I mean, I don't know why. I don't know why every church or at least 25% of the churches which would still be what? 15,000, 12,000. Be way more than we've had. Yeah. Uh, I, I just tell them, I don't know. I mean, I get everybody's busy and, and it's hard to be engaged and your churches are big and there's this and there's that thing and marriages and funerals and counseling. But uh, you just, I don't know. Maybe it's just because some churches are just, they're so, maybe they're so big and they don't have enough leadership maybe, or they just, they don't think they care. And maybe it's another conversation for another time, but um, yeah, get to, get to New Orleans and support your church or support churches for, to go right i mean yeah. you know, even if even if you're not sbc you can you probably know somebody who's in the sbc so anyway i appreciate the time tom you want to add anything last last 60 well, I, seconds before we close yeah, out appreciate all you're doing and uh grateful for the opportunity to have these kind of conversations yeah well, i appreciate it sir i'll uh see you in new orleans hopefully and right. until then everybody else god bless and have a good day <laughs>